Hi guys! Welcome to another episode of Attorney Job Vlogger, Law for the Everyday Layman. Today, we continue our discussion on corporation law under the Revised Corporation Code. And today, we'll be talking about stockholders, their rights, powers, and liabilities. So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. A like on this video as well as my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. Okay? So today we'll talk about stockholders and as the word implies, a stockholder is a person who owns stock in a stock corporation. In my, episode on, in my episodes on stocks, I already discussed how does one become an owner of stocks or how does one become a stockholder. And to review, a person can become a stockholder through a subscription contract, purchase of treasury shares, sale or other transfer from a previous shareholder of the outstanding shares or existing subscription to shares, or through stock dividends. Okay? Just take note that the stockholder must pay for his subscription. And in case he fails to pay, he may suffer the effects of delinquency. I talked about that already before. Huh? Because uh, those stocks must be fully paid in order to protect the interests of corporate creditors in line with the trust fund doctrine. I discussed all of these in my episodes on stocks. So please just uh, watch those episodes. Now, the relation between the corporation and the stockholder is contractual, which arises by virtue of the stock which is acquired by the stockholder through any of the means I mentioned earlier. Now that uh, shares of stock, those are not uh, indebtedness of the corporation to the stockholder. Huh? It's not an evidence of indebtedness. And therefore, it is not credit. Okay? The stockholder, by reason of his ownership of the stock, he is not a creditor of the corporation. And the corporation, he is not a debtor okay, to the stockholder. Also remember, a stockholder does not own any specific property of the corporation. Okay? And the corporation is the owner of its corporate property. The stockholder is also not entitled to possession of the corporate property as a matter of right at least until uh, liquidation proceedings no have ended okay because of the separate juridical personality of the corporation okay i talked about this already in my uh, earlier episodes i'm just talking about it now to review so the theory of a stock corporation is that the stockholders may have all the profits but they turn over the actual management of the enterprise to their representatives known as the directors or the officers also no i have separate episodes on the board of directors or trustees just watch those as well however despite that no the stockholders still have certain rights or remedies expressly recognized by the law so there are three categories of stockholder rights and powers no we have direct or indirect participation in management we have proprietary rights and we also have remedial rights so under the management rights these can be uh, indirect or direct the indirect management rights would be the right to vote or elect directors as well as the right to remove these directors and under the direct uh, power of management the stockholders have the right to give approval to cer certain corporate actions like investment in another corporation or business or the others that I talked about in uh, previous episodes on the the previous episodes on the powers of corporations okay also under the direct management the stockholders have the right to adopt and amend or re repeal bylaws or even to adopt new bylaws they also have the right to attend and vote in person or by proxy at stockholders' meetings. And they also have the right to compel the calling of meetings of stockholders when for any cause there is no person authorized to call a meeting or the person so authorized refuses to call a meeting. So that's it for the management rights. For proprietary rights, we have uh, several. No? We have the right to dividends under Section 42. The appraisal right or the right to demand payment of the value of office shares and withdraw from the corporation in certain cases, no? Under sections 40 and 80. 
He also has the right to the issuance of a stock certificate for fully paid shares under Section 62. He also has the right to have the corporation voluntarily dissolved. He also has the right to proportionately participate in the distribution of assets on liquidation. For those two, dissolution and liquidation, we'll talk about that when we get to the respective episodes, okay? The stockholder's proprietary right also includes the right to transfer stocks, no? Under Section 62. There's also the preemptive right in the issue of shares under Section 38 or also the right of first refusal, which is not the same. Huh? He can also have the right of first refusal if so granted. No, He also has the right to inspect books and records under Section 73, the right to financial statements under Section 74, the right to recover stocks unlawfully sold for delinquent payment of subscriptions under Section 68, the right to enter into a voting trust agreement under Section 58, and also the right to commence suits no? or cases, which brings us to remedial rights. And there are three kinds of uh, cases which a stockholder can bring. There is the individual suit, there is the representative suit, and the derivative suit. I'll talk about that a little later, okay? So while I have discussed certain powers of uh, corporations which need stockholder approval in the previous episodes, to make your lives easier, I'll just list, I'll give you a list of uh, the Corporate Act and the required votes, no? So, for the following acts that I will mention now, after a majority vote by the board, what is required is approval by two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or of the members as may be applicable, okay? Two-thirds vote, okay? First, amendment of the articles under Section 15. Second, removal of directors under Section 27. Third, dealings of directors, trustees, officers with the corporation under Section 31. Fourth, disloyalty of a director under Section 33. Fifth, power to extend or shorten the corporate term under Section 37. Power to increase or decrease capital stock, incur, create, or increase bonded indebtedness under Section 37. Sale or other disposition of assets under Section 39. Eighth, Power to invest corporate funds in another corporation or business or for any other purpose under Section 41. We also have declaration of stock dividends under Section 42. We also have power to enter into management contract of the managed corporation. Take note, the managed corporation requires a two-thirds vote of the outstanding capital stock. This is under Section 43. Okay, you'll see the difference later. 11. Delegation of the power to amend or repeal the bylaws or adopt new bylaws to the directors. Okay, delegation, ha? Delegation of the power needs two-thirds. That's under section 47. Number 12, approval or amendment of a plan of merger or consolidation for both corporations, no? Both the merging corporations or the corporations to be consolidated under section 76. And finally, voluntary dissolution under Section 134 and 135. Okay, all those instances I mentioned require a two-thirds vote of the outstanding capital stock. Okay, now, in the next instances I will be listing, double majority is required. Majority of the board, majority of the stockholders. No longer two-thirds, ah, majority only. Okay, so uh, these are the instances. First, election of directors or trustees under section 23. Second, filling of vacancies in the office of director or trustee when there is no more quorum in the board under section 28. Third, compensation of directors. Fourth, power to enter into management contract for both the managing and managed corporations if there are no interlocking directors or interlocking stockholders. Okay, that's under section 43. Take note of the difference, huh? Earlier, two-thirds vote if of the managing managed corporation if there is no uh, if there is interlocking uh, directors or stockholders, but only majority for both corporations if there are no interlocking directors or stockholders. There are interlocking two-thirds of the managed. Okay, there are no interlocking directors or stockholders, just a simple majority of both corporations. 
Okay? Then, adoption of bylaws under Section 45 and amendment to bylaws under Section 47. All those instances that I just mentioned, double majority. Majority vote board, majority approval by stockholders. Okay? So, we've already discussed several of these rights and powers in previous episodes. So, I will just focus on the rights and powers which I have not yet discussed. I've already discussed amendment of the articles in my episode on incorporation, so please just watch that. Remember, the articles can be amended by majority vote of the board and approved by two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or members. Just take note that in case there is a dissenting stockholder, meaning he dis disagrees with the amendment of the articles, he can exercise his appraisal right. Also, take note that the grounds for which the SEC can deny the articles when it is first submitted for approval during incorporation, those grounds may also be used as grounds by the SEC to approve or disapprove any amendment to the articles. But of course, the SEC still has to give the corporation a reasonable time from receipt of the disapproval within which to modify the objectionable portions of the articles or the amendment okay the amendments they will take effect either upon their approval by the SEC or from the date of filing if the SEC does not act does not act within 6 months from the date of filing for a cause not attributable to the corporation now, elections, removal, dealings, disloyalty, compensation, filling of vacancies in the board. I've talked all about, uh, about all that in uh, my series on the board of directors, so please just watch that, okay? Now, uh, the power to extend or shorten corporate term, increase or decrease capital stock, to incur, create, increase bonded indebtedness, sale or other disposition of assets, power to invest corporate funds in another corporation or business or for any other purpose, to declare stock dividends, to enter into management contract. I also talked about all of those in, in my episodes on powers of corporations. Please just watch those as well. No. So now what we can talk about would be adoption, amendment, and delegation to the board of the power to amend or repeal or adopt new bylaws. So I mentioned that bylaws, I, mean, I already talked about bylaws in my episode on incorporation. So remember that these are rules for the internal governance of the corporation and they contain the rights and duties of stockholders to the corporation and vice versa, as well as amongst themselves. Now the bylaws may be adopted and filed with the SEC after incorporation, but the law also allows the incorporators to file the bylaws together with the articles during the application for incorporation which i said is a better move and in which case the bylaws should be approved and signed by all the incorporators but if the bylaws are adopted after incorporation section 45 requires the affirmative vote of stockholders representing majority of the stockholders owning the outstanding capital stock or if non-stock corporations majority of the members the bylaws should be signed by the stockholders who vote for them and should be kept in the principal office and subject of course to inspection the bylaws should be filed with the sec and should be attached to the articles and those bylaws they will be effective only upon issuance by the sec of a certification that they are in accordance with law and of course in case of banks other financial institutions or those governed by special laws the bylaws must be accompanied by a certificate of the appropriate government agency that the bylaws or amendments are in accordance with the law for the contents of the bylaws that's usually pro forma but of course they the uh, members of the corporation can just add to it, no? And it's mostly codal. You can just check it out, okay? I won't uh, list it down here. Now, to amend, repeal, or adopt new bylaws, double majority is required, no? So, majority vote of the board, approved by majority of the outstanding capital stock or members, and in case of amendment or new bylaws, they must be filed with the SEC and will be, effective, will be effective when the SEC issues a certification that they are in accordance with law. But take note, 
in case of delegation ha huh? delegation they are giving the power okay in case of delegation by the stockholders to the board of the power to amend or repeal or adopt new bylaws what is required is affirmative vote of two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or members not majority ah huh? earlier to amend repeal or adopt new bylaws majority only but if they are giving the power to the board delegation ha huh? two-thirds now is required okay this delegation of power may be revoked by a simple majority of the outstanding capital stock or members at a regular or special meeting now we can move on to approval or amendment of plan of merger or consolidation Okay? While we'll talk about merger and consolidation per se in a different episode, what you need to know now is that before merger or consolidation may take place, the board of the corporations which will be merged or consolidated must first approve a plan of merger or consolidation. That plan must be approved by two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or members of each of the corporations to be merged or consolidated in separate meetings, of course. No? If there are any stockholders who dissent, they will be entitled to exercise their appraisal right. Take note that even if the stockholders approve the plan, the board may still decide to abandon that plan, which in turn will extinguish the appraisal right. Now, amendments may also be made to that plan by majority vote of the board, but it will again be subject to approval by two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or members. And when that plan is approved, that plan now becomes what is known as the agreement of merger or consolidation. Now, on to voluntary dissolution. Well, I will talk about the solution in a separate episode, no? What I can say now is that in case of voluntary dissolution where no creditors are affected, the dissolution may be initiated by majority vote of the board and approved by majority of the outstanding capital stock or members upon which a verified request for dissolution shall be filed with the SEC. But in case of voluntary dissolution where creditors will be affected, Dissolution should be done through a verified petition for dissolution which is signed by majority of the board and the decision to dissolve the corporation should have been approved by two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or members. In case of dissolution by shortening of corporate term, since this is done by amendment of the articles, just follow the rules on amendment of articles, no? namely majority vote of the board and approval by two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or, of, or the members. Okay. Now, let's talk about uh, the stockholders' appraisal right which may be uh, exercised when a stockholder disagrees with a proposed corporate action involving a fundamental change in the articles. Under Section 80, any stockholder of a corporation shall have the right to dissent and demand payment of the fair value of his shares in the following instances. First, in case an amendment to the Articles of Incorporation has the effect of changing or restricting the rights of any stockholder or class of shares or of authorizing preferences in any respect superior to those of outstanding shares of any class or of extending or shortening the term of corporate existence. That's the first instance, no? In that first instance, there are already several. Second, in case of sale, lease, exchange, transfer, mortgage, pledge, or other disposition of all or substantially all of the corporate property and assets. Okay? Appraisal right is available. Third, in case of merger or consolidation. And fourth, in case of investment of corporate funds for any purpose other than the primary purpose of the corporation. Okay? So take note that the appraisal right does not normally belong to a stockholder as a matter of absolute right. Otherwise, a stockholder can withdraw from a corporation anytime by returning his share and getting back his capital, which will violate the trust fund doctrine. The stockholder can only exercise his appraisal right in the cases mentioned by law or by the articles of incorporation. 
to exercise the appraisal right, the stockholder must vote against the proposed corporate action. Okay? He should dissent. Okay? In other words, the right is not available if he was absent at the meeting where the action was approved or he, he was present but he abstained from voting. Again, he must have dissented. Further, after dissenting, the stockholder must make a written demand on the corporation for the payment of the fair value of shares that he holds, no? And it must be made within 30 days from the date on which the vote was taken. If he fails to make the demand within that period, then it will be deemed as a waiver of his appraisal right. If the proposed corporate action is implemented, then the corporation shall pay the stockholder upon surrender of his stock certificate. He will pay the corporation will pay the fair value as of the day before the vote was taken, excluding of course any appreciation or depreciation in anticipation of such corporate action. Now, if within 60 days from the approval of the corporate action by the stockholders, the withdrawing stockholder and the corporation, they cannot agree on the fair value of the shares. Then they can name three disinterested persons, one of whom will be named by the stockholder, the second by the corporation, and the third by uh, the two who are chosen. No? These, will, uh, these people will now act as appraisers and their findings, the findings of the majority of the appraisers shall be final and that award will be paid by the corporation to the stockholder within 30 days from the date that the award is made. Okay? So who bears the cost and expenses of appraisal? Well, where the price which the corporation offered to pay the stockholder is lower than the fair value as determined by the appraisers or where the action is filed by the stockholder to recover the fair value and the refusal of the stockholder to receive payment is justified okay in these cases then the corporation bears the cost and expenses of appraisal but where the price offered by the corporation is approximately the same as the fair value ascertained by the appraisers or where the stockholder files an action for the fair value and his refusal to accept payment is unjustified, then the stockholder bears the cost and expenses of appraisal. Take note that no payment shall be made to any dissenting stockholder unless the corporation has unrestricted retained earnings in its books to cover such payment. Upon payment by the corporation of the agreed or awarded price, then the stockholder will now transfer the shares to the corporation. So what if the corporation unjustifiably refuses to pay the dissenting stockholder despite full compliance with all requirements for valid exercise of the appraisal right, and despite the fact that the corporation has unrestricted retained earnings? Then the stockholder in the appropriate uh, cases, no, he may file the appropriate case before the proper court to compel the corporation to allow him to exercise his appraisal right. Okay? So once the dissenting stockholder demands payment of the fair value of his shares, these are the effects. First, all rights accruing to such shares, no, including voting and dividend rights, those rights will be suspended. And second, he shall be entitled to receive payment of the fair value of his shares as agreed upon by him and the corporation or as determined by the appraisers which I mentioned earlier. The corporation must pay the value of the shares to the stockholders, stockholder within 30 days of the award. And if not, then the voting rights, dividend rights, they will be restored to the stockholder until he receives the payment. And once the stockholder is paid for his shares, all his rights as a stockholder are now terminated. So once a stockholder makes a demand for payment, no, he makes a demand, he can no longer withdraw his demand except when allowed by law. Specifically first, if the withdrawal of the demand is with the consent of the corporation, if the corporation allows it. Second, if the proposed corporate action is abandoned or rescinded by the corporation. Third, the SEC disapproves the corporate act in case SEC approval is required. Or fourth, 
where the SEC determines that the stockholder is not entitled to the appraisal right. In any of those cases I mentioned, the right of the stockholder to be paid the fair value of the shares shall cease and his status as stockholder shall be restored and all dividend distributions which would have accrued on the shares shall now be paid to the stockholder. Okay? Now, within 10 days after demanding payment for shares held, a dissenting stockholder shall submit the certificates of stock for notation that such shares are dissenting shares. If he fails to do so, then at the option of the corporation, the rights of the stockholder associated with the appraisal right will terminate. Okay, mawawala. Now, even if the shares have a notation, they can still be transferred or sold by the dissenting stockholder to someone else. And in such a case, the dissenting stockholder shall lose his right to receive the fair value of his shares. Why? Because he already sold it. And that's what he gets now in payment done. Okay? So he loses the right to receive the fair value of his shares. And the transferee shall now become a regular stockholder with the right to receive all dividends under those shares. Now let's talk about the stockholder's right to inspect corporate books and to request financial statements. Now a corporation is required to keep the following books at its principal office. The articles and the bylaws as well as all the amendments of course. The current ownership structure and voting rights of the corporation including lists of stockholders or members, intergroup relations, etc. Third, names and addresses of all the members of the board and the executive officers. Fourth, a record of all business transactions. Fifth, a record of the resolutions of the board and the stockholders or members. Next, copies of the latest reportorial requirements submitted to the SEC. Next, minutes of all meetings of stockholders or members or of the board. And finally, stock and transfer book. Okay? Those are all codal. Don't worry. I'll just explain a little bit on the stock and transfer book that should contain a record of all the stocks in the name of stockholders alphabetically arranged okay it will also contain installments paid and, uh, and unpaid on all stocks for which subscription has been made it will also include the date of payment of any installment a statement of every alienation sale or transfer of the stock made the date thereof by and to whom made and such other entries as the bylaws may prescribe, okay? Now, that stock and transfer book, unlike the other records which should be kept at the principal office, the stock and transfer book may be kept either in the principal office or if the corporation has a stock transfer agent, then it will be kept, it may be kept in the office of the stock transfer agent. That stock transfer agent, they must secure a license from the SEC in order to, for them to operate as a stock transfer agent. Of course, if there are other laws that require records to be kept, then the corporation should keep those as well. And the corporation can also add to the list of uh, records to be kept. Okay. Now, Section 73 grants the right of inspection and upon written demand to copy or reproduce corporate books at the expense of the party so requesting. No? That right is granted to any director, trustee, stockholder, or member, whether by whether in person or by representative. But it must be done at reasonable hours on business days. This right to inspection or reproduction is subject to confidentiality rules under prevailing laws like the Intellectual Property Code, Data Privacy Act, Securities Regulation Code and Rules of Court among others. No? And if this right is abused, the party at fault may be penalized. Take note that the right is only granted to the director, trustee, stockholder or member or their representative. A requesting party, the party who requests who is not a stockholder or a member of record or is a competitor, director, officer, controlling stockholder, or otherwise represents the interests of a competitor, they have no right to inspect or demand reproduction of corporate records. Okay? Now, this right to inspect and copy is based on the fact that while stock stockholders 
do not own any specific property or assets of the corporation, they have beneficial ownership of that property or assets through their shares. The law allows this right mainly to protect minority stockholders against mismanagement of the corporation. Okay, and to ascertain, establish, and maintain their rights and intelligently perform their corporate duties. Okay? Likewise, this right protects the public from monopolies, unlawful combinations, and unreasonable exaction from corporations. Okay? Unreasonable exactions from corporations. So what if this right to inspect or reproduce is denied? If the corporation denies or does not act on a demand for inspection or reproduction, then the aggrieved party may report such denial or inaction to the SEC. The SEC will conduct a summary investigation and issue an order directing the inspection or reproduction of the requested records within five days from receipt of such report. A stockholder may also avail of the remedy of mandamus before the proper court to compel the exercise of the right okay now the officer or agent of the corporation who refuses to allow the inspection or reproduction of the records shall be guilty of an of an offense punishable under section 161 with a fine from 10,000 pesos to 200,000 pesos but if it is injurious or detrimental to the public the fine is higher 20,000 to 400,000 pesos but if the, re the refusal of uh, this right is done through a board resolution, then the liability will be imposed on the directors or trustees who voted in favor of the resolution. Now, the accused, no, those, uh, the director or officer, they may defend themselves. Okay, They may defend themselves by saying that the requesting party has improperly used any information secured through... Uh, any prior examination of the records or minutes of the corporation or any other corporation, huh? not just the corporation in question, okay? Or was not acting in good faith or for a legitimate purpose in making the demand. Or the requesting party is a competitor or some other person representing a competitor. Those are all defenses, okay? So a corporation has the right to refuse uh, the inspection or reproduction in case of trade secrets okay so those are the limitations on the right to inspect and copy and when uh, and when such right may be denied may properly be denied okay why because the right to inspect or copy that's not an absolute right okay however of course the presumption is that the stockholder is making a request for a legitimate purpose and it is the burden of the corporation to prove otherwise now, a stockholder may also make a written request to the corporation for its most recent financial statement. Okay, and uh, that financial statement must be furnished within 10 days from receipt by the corporation of the request. So, a financial statement includes a balance sheet as of the end of the taxable year and a profit and loss statement for said year, showing in reasonable detail its assets and liabilities and the results of its operations okay so there's also the right to financial statements now let's talk about meetings i briefly mentioned this in passing in previous episodes meetings are necessary because stockholders may only act through by convening in meetings so that they can discuss and vote together meetings may be regular or those held annually on a date fixed in, a, in the bylaws or if it's not so fixed then on any date after April 15 of every year as determined by the board. Okay? Written notice, of course, of the meeting must be sent to the stockholder at least 21 days prior to the meeting. Okay? Meetings may also be special meetings and uh, they may be held at any time deemed necessary or as provided in the bylaws, in which case written notice must be sent at least one week before. Okay? Notices may be waived, but uh, general waivers such as those included in the articles or bylaws, they are not allowed. If notice is not sent 
but the stockholder is present in the meeting, then that constitutes a waiver of notice. Except when the stockholder attends for the express purpose of objecting to the transaction of any business on the ground that the meeting was not lawfully called. Okay? Now, if there is no person authorized or the person authorized unjustly refuses, refuses to call a meeting, a stockholder may file a petition with the SEC which shall issue an order directing the petitioning stockholder to call a meeting by giving a proper notice. And the petitioning stockholder will preside until the stockholders present in the meeting choose a presiding officer. If the regular meeting is postponed, then written notice and the reason for postponement must be sent to all stockholders at least two weeks prior to the date of the meeting, unless a different period is required by the law or the bylaws. Now, for a meeting to be valid, it must be held at the proper place, which under Section 50 must be in the principal office, or if not practic practicable, then in the city or municipality where the principal office is located. It must be held at the stated date and at the appointed time or reasonable time thereafter. The meeting must also be called by the proper person stated in the bylaws or by the director or officer entrusted with the management of the corporation or even by a stockholder if there is no person authorized or the person authorized unjustly refuses to call a meeting. Take note, ha, take note, that the person authorized to call, to make a call, is different from the person who presides. Because under Section 53, the person who presides is either the chairman or if he is not available or in his absence, no, then it is the president. Okay, unless of course otherwise provided in the bylaws. Of course, there must also be previous notice as previously discussed and uh, the meeting the notice of the meeting should contain the agenda as well as the date the time and the place of the meeting among others now for the meeting to be valid it also should have a quorum which under section 51 consists of the stockholders representing a majority of the outstanding capital stock or members but the bylaws may provide for a different number to constitute a quorum which according to some opinions must be at least two persons. Now take note that even if the meeting is improperly called, then all proceedings had and any business transacted at any meeting of the stockholders shall be valid, provided that the proceedings had and the business transacted are within the power or authority of the corporation and that all the stockholders are present or represented at the meeting. Now, the right to vote is an incident of ownership of stock. And if this right is not denied by virtue of the class of stock, remember, certain classes of stock may be deprived of the right to vote, no? Then if the stockholder has the right to vote, then he cannot be deprived of his right without his consent. So a stockholder may vote directly by himself or indirectly through a representative by means of a proxy, by a trustee under a voting trust agreement, or by executors, administrators, receivers, and other legal representatives duly appointed by the court without need of written proxy in the cases of uh, th those representatives. Okay. Now take note of section 54. As an incident of ownership, a stockholder may have used his stocks as security for a principal obligation. In such a case, even though the stocks serve as security, the stockholder still has the right to attend and vote at meetings because he is still the absolute owner. However, if by virtue of the contract of security, the stockholder expressly gives the creditor the right to attend and vote and this is recorded in the corporate books, then it is the creditor who can now attend and vote at the meeting. In case there are two or more owners of stocks, the, co the consent of all is necessary to vote. Because they're co-owners, no? they own the same shares of stock. Okay? So the consent of all is necessary to vote unless there is a written proxy signed by all the co-owners authorizing one or some of them or any other person to vote on their behalf. 
take note that if the shares are owned in an and or capacity then that is joint ownership so any one of the joint owners can vote on said shares or appoint a proxy so you have to know the nature of the ownership huh? so a stockholder may vote in person or by proxy or through remote communication or even in absentia and in the latter case the stockholder shall be deemed present for purposes of the quorum requirement earlier I mentioned proxy so let's talk about that a proxy is a formal written authority given by the owner or holder of the stock who has the right to vote he gives it to another person who acts as the stockholders agent to exercise the stockholders voting rights let's say I own stocks okay I make a proxy and I uh, authorize this other person to exercise my voting rights on my behalf it's a special form of agency and it's expressly allowed under section 57 so for a proxy to be valid it must be in writing signed and filed by the stockholder or member in any form authorized in the bylaws and received by the corporate secretary within a reasonable time before the scheduled meeting unless otherwise provided in the proxy it will be valid only for the meeting for which it is intended take note that no proxy including continuing proxies shall be valid and effective for a period longer than five years at any one time so hanggang five years lang ha proxies are revocable at any time unless expressly stated to be irrevocable or when it is coupled with an interest meaning it's supported by a consideration like a loan okay and revocation how is it made just by notifying the proxy holder or by signing a new proxy in favor of someone else or if the stockholder attends the meeting and votes personally no he, he appears so bali wala na proxy because he's there na now let's talk about voting trust agreements these are agreements in writing notarized and filed with the corporation and the sec whereby one or more stockholders of a stock corporation transfer their shares to any person or persons or even to another corporation who will now have the authority to act as trustee for the purpose of vesting in them as trustees voting or other rights pertaining to the shares for a certain period not exceeding five years and upon the terms and conditions stated in the agreement okay but uh, in case of a voting trust agreement let's just say vta okay vta specially required as a condition in a loan agreement then it may be for a period exceeding five years but it shall automatically expire upon full payment of the loan now, the purpose of uh, VTAs no, are to serve as a device to control voting on corporate matters. VTAs allow for unified control of the affairs of the corporation and for consistent policy by binding the stockholders to vote as a unit through the trust. Okay? Under such agreement, title to the shares is transferred to the trustee on the books of the corporation and the certificates of stock are surrendered and cancelled and new certificates are issued in the name of the voting trustee stating that they are issued pursuant to the VTA the books of the corporation shall state that the transfer in the name of the trustees is made pursuant to the VTA that VTA should be filed with the corporation because it's subject to examination by any stockholder and if it is not filed, then the VTA will be ineffective and unenforceable. Now, if there is a VTA, other stockholders may join in, okay? And they may transfer their shares to the same trustee or trustees under the same terms and conditions upon which they will be bound thereby. So, in a VTA, the stockholder only parts with the voting power. But he is still the beneficial owner of the stock. The trustee will only have apparent legal title for the sole purpose of voting on the stocks that he does not own. Okay? He is just a trustee. He does not become the owner. He is only the apparent legal owner. The implication is that the trustor, the original stockholder, huh? the trustor, still has his other rights. 
like the right to dividends or the right to inspect. The voting trustee or trustees now have the right to vote personally or by proxy or in any other manner authorized by the bylaws unless the VTA provides otherwise. They may also exercise the right of inspection and reproduction and they are also qualified to be a director. Why? Because they now have legal title to the shares. So take note of the limitations. Again, the VTA must be written and notarized. It must be filed with the corporation and the SEC. It shall be subject to examination by any stockholder. It will not be valid if the period exceeds five years except when entered into as a condition for a loan agreement which may exceed five years but will automatically expire upon full payment of the loan. Another limitation is that all rights granted, granted under the VTA will automatically expire at the end of the agreed period unless the VTA is renewed. So the voting trust certificates and certificates of stock in the name of the trustees will be deemed cancelled and new certificates will be reissued in the name of the trustors, meaning the original stockholders. Okay, another limitation. No voting trust agreement shall be entered into for the purposes of circumventing the laws against anti-competitive agreements, abuse of dominant position, anti-competitive mergers and acquisitions, violation of nationality and capital requirements, or for the perpetration of fraud. Okay? Now, let's talk about the right of a stockholder to file suits. So as I discussed in a previous episode, a corporation has the power to sue and be sued. And given the separate juridical personality of the corporation, it is the corporation itself through its board and not the stockholder who is the proper party to bring a suit on its own behalf. However, when the officials of a corporation refuse or fail to file a case to seek redress for a wrong done to a corporation or when it is the officials themselves or the corporation that must be sued, then a stockholder may file a case to enforce the corporate right to file suits either on behalf of uh, the other stockholders, on behalf of the corporation, or even for himself. So these are the three kinds of suits a stockholder may bring. We have the representative suit, derivative suit, and individual suit. So a derivative suit is a case filed by one or more stockholders in the name of and on behalf of the corporation to, redraw, to redress harms or wrongs committed against the corporation itself or to protect or vindicate corporate rights whenever the officials of the corporation refuse to sue or if the officials are the ones to be sued themselves. In this kind of suit, the stockholder is merely a nominal party. The real party in interest here is the corporation. So, in the caption of the pleading, the name of the corporation must be stated and he must be listed in the parties as the real party in interest. Take note that the, take note that the harm or uh, the injury is not done to the stockholder himself. The, the injury was done to the corporation. And the stockholder is merely filing a suit for the corporation because the ones who are supposed to file the case, namely the board, they refuse or they are actually the ones who are supposed to be sued. Okay, That's why it's called a derivative suit. The stockholder derives his right to file the case from the right of the corporation to file the case. Okay, Since it's a derivative suit, any amounts recovered as a result of the case will pertain to the corporation but the stockholder is allowed to be reimbursed for legal expenses. So to bring a derivative suit, the stockholder must prove that there is a cause of action in favor of the corporation, meaning he must prove that there are acts detrimental or caused injury to the corporation. Okay, He must also prove that he was a stockholder at the time the acts or the transaction occurred and at the time of the filing of the case. The stockholder must also allege that he exerted all reasonable efforts to exhaust all intracorporate remedies that no appraisal rights are available. Okay? He must also allege that the corporation or the board refuses to sue. And finally, he must say that the suit is not a nuisance or harassment suit. So that's it for derivative suits. 
Now, an individual suit is a case filed by a stockholder against the corporation for direct violation of his contractual rights as an individual stockholder, such as his right to vote, to share in dividends, inspect books, etc. Here, the wrong, the harm, the injury is personally done to or directly inflicted against the stockholder himself. So it is the stockholder who can file an individual suit against the corporation. And any recovery in this case belongs to the stockholder because he is bringing the action on his own behalf. A representative suit, on the other hand, is one which a group of stockholders may bring against a corporation on their own behalf as well as other stockholders who are similarly situated. So let's say a group of stockholders have been denied their right to vote or to compel declaration of dividends when so allowed by law, then they can bring a representative suit against the corporation. Okay? So those are the three kinds of suits. Finally, let's talk about the liabilities of stockholders. First, of course, their liability to the corporation for unpaid subscription. Second, their liability to the corporation for interest on those unpaid subscriptions. Third, their liability to corporate creditors for unpaid subscription based on the trust fund doctrine. Fourth, for dividends unlawfully paid and received by them. No? So the stockholder in that case should refund the amounts received in case dividends are wrongfully or illegally declared and paid, even though it was in good faith. Okay. And finally, liability for watered stock. And what are watered stock? They are stock issued for no value at all or for a value that is less than its equivalent in cash, property, services, or stock dividends. It includes stock issued without consideration, which is a bonus share, stock issued as fully paid when the corporation has received a lesser sum of money than its par or issued value, which is a discount share, it also includes stock issued for a consideration other than actual cash, such as property or services, the fair valuation of which is less than its par or issued value, or stock issued as stock dividend when there are no sufficient retained earnings or surplus to justify its issuance. The issuance of watered stock is prohibited. No? Why? To protect persons who may acquire stock and those who may become creditors of the corporation on the faith of its outstanding capital stock being fully paid. The prohibition secures equality among subscribers and it prevents discrimination against those who have paid in full the par or issued value of their shares. Take note that the prohibition to issue watered, to issue watered stock refers only to the original shares original issue of stocks but not to a subsequent transfer of such stock by the corporation because in that case it's no longer an issue but a sale okay so it only applies to the original issue of stock now if the corporation issues watered stock then such issuance is not just ultra virus but it is illegal per se why because it violates section 61 which says that stocks shall not be issued for a consideration than less than the par or issued price thereof. So section 64 says that a director or officer of a corporation who consents to the issuance of stocks for a consideration less than its par or issued value, consents to the issuance of stocks for consideration other than cash valued in excess of its fair value, or having knowledge of the insufficient consideration does not file a written objection with the corporate secretary that director or officer shall be liable to the corporation or its creditors solidarily with the stockholder concerned for the difference between the value received at the time of issuance of the stock and the par or issued value of that stock okay so the law holds both the director and the concerned stockholder solidarily liable. And not only the corporate creditors, but also the corporation itself or any stockholder for and in behalf of the corporation, they can set up 
the inadequacy of the consideration for the issuance of stop in a case on that matter. Okay? So that's it for the rights, powers, and liabilities of stockholders. I hope you may have picked up a thing or two, and I hope to see you next time, guys. Okay? See you soon. Bye.